What's up, trumpet players? Welcome to the channel. If you're not a trumpet player, welcome anyway. So, I normally don't do reaction type videos on this channel, but this video is just too good not to react to. So, this is Brass Chats Jim Pandolfi by Monster Oil. And this particular trumpet interview, I would consider it to be the best trumpet interview of all time, just in my opinion. And for two reasons. Number one, Jim Pandolfi's philosophy on how to approach and how to teach the trumpet is probably the closest to my own personal philosophy of any other trumpet player. And also because this one particular interview has so many golden nuggets of information in it. Like I would say that this one interview is worth about 100 trumpet lessons. So it's well worth your time. I really encourage you to watch this all the way through because it's got so many gems of wisdom in it. And I'm going to be breaking it down. I'm going to be sharing my own thoughts on the different things that he says in this. I'm going to be like further explaining it, giving a little more additional insight. And it's going to be just a fun time. So before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up so that more people can see it, more people can benefit from this video. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel. Love to have you. Love to have you around. Be part of the community. And also make sure that you subscribe to Monster Royal as well. They're the uh, original... This is their video, so make sure that you head over to their channel as well and support their channel. So, without any further ado, let's just get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to Brass Chats. Today we're sitting down with a gentleman who is a retired third trumpet with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and one of the most sought after trumpet teachers in the country, <laughs> Mr. Jim Pandolfi. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Hi. Cool, so I forgot to introduce Jim, give a little background on him. So Jim Pandov, he, he's the retired third trumpet player of the Metropolitan Opera. So he played primarily under Mark Gould, who was the principal at that time. Not sure if there were other principals, I'd have to do a little research on that, but I think he was primarily under Mark Gould when he was in the Met. He was also the principal of the Rhode Island Symphony. We'll hear more about his background, a little bit more about his history, about how he led up to a trumpet player in one of the most coveted groups in the world, like the Metropolitan Opera. I believe it is the highest paying trumpet gig in the world right now. So yeah, that's a little bit of background on Jim. And he's also known as the Yoda of the trumpet. At least that's what David Krause is, but we're going to get into that. Let's, let's just keep going. Pleasure to be here. Let's start off with David Krause. We interviewed him a while back and okay. he calls you the Yoda of the trumpet. <laughs> What types of things did you guys work on together? Why does he say that? Uh, he's, well, when I first met Dave, uh, he wasn't playing very well. And I, I... Okay, so this is really big talk. And I'm, I'm not, it, he deserves to have the big talk. Like Jim Pandolf, he's a legend. Like you said, he's the Yoda of trumpet. But he's talking about David Krause here. David Kraus is the current principal of the Metropolitan Opera. Like he is a phenomenal player. Like he teaches... He's faculty at a lot of the New York schools. He's faculty at Rutgers right next to New York City. So David Cross is a monster trumpet player. But for someone like Jim Pandolfi to say that he wasn't playing well at the time that he met him, it just speaks the volume about how legendary of a teacher that Jim is. So just hyping him up a little bit more for you guys. I, I evaluated him. In a lesson, and I told him, Dave, if you want to study with me, you have to turn around 180 degrees and go exactly the opposite direction. And What was he so, doing? Uh, he was breathing down low. He was trying to make a big sound. He was All right, so there's a lot of terminology in trumpet teaching that I really just don't like. And Jim's going to talk about this as well. He's going to talk about there's a lot of vocabulary out there that's really counterproductive to getting a good result on the trumpet. And I try to avoid this vocabulary at all costs. So breathe down low is one of them. So, so many trumpet players are taught to breathe down low. They're taught to breathe to the diaphragm or even to the stomach. But something that I learned from studying with Pete Bond, who, who was also, he took Jim's spot, essentially. He became the third trumpet player of the Metropolitan Opera. But something that I learned from Pete is that you can't breathe like a tuba player. Don't take a tuba breath. So tuba players are taught to breathe down low. They're taught to take these big diaphragmic breaths. However, tubas and trumpets are completely different registers. We have two different two different registers. Just like I guess I'm over explaining this. But if you want a good sound in our register, we need to take a different kind of a breath than if we wanted a good sound in a completely different register. So there's a certain 
way we need to use our bodies that's ideal for trumpet playing and then there's a certain way that's really ideal for tuba playing so it's two different things it's not completely universal for all brass instruments so it's more of an upper respiratory top of the lungs kind of a breath for trumpet but we'll get into that it was doing everything wrong and uh so basically i got him to change everything and to his credit he took it and he made it his own and he figured out how to do it for himself and it's, it's just terrific and let's get into specifics about that uh you, you mentioned the breathing um this is one of your big things i mean uh talk to me about the breathing well it it, <coughs> it used to be because you see you have to understand that most of the things that i say are designed to fix problems mm -hmm. because when people come to see me they have problems yeah so it's the same thing for me as well like when someone comes when someone applies to work with me it's because they they've had some bad habits like the most of the pe people who work with me have been playing for decades and then they've got decades worth of bad habits that they're trying to fix and that they need a completely different approach to playing the trumpet so yeah so a lot of these teaching is designed to be very different from conventional trumpet teaching to give a brand new approach that's essentially designed to fix problems and correct bad habits from old ways of teaching but we'll get into this playing or else they wouldn't be here right because i generally ask my guys why are you here mm -hmm. and last trumpet lesson i had i was 20 years old that's a fact and when uh -huh. i did have trumpet lessons no one told me how to play the trumpet. I figured this out on my own. I mean, yeah. uh, when I was a youngster, my dad was a trumpet player, and I had his sound in my ear when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and he used to tell me... Yeah, so that's really important. So, like, when we're trying to make a good trumpet sound, we need to have someone else's sound in our mind that we're trying to model. So... This is extremely important because if we don't have that clear vision of what we want to sound like, then it's so hard to get a good result. Like when I'm playing principal in an orchestra, I'm usually thinking about Phil Smith. Like I love Phil's sound and I'm trying to get that ringing and resonant sound that Phil has. If I'm playing commercial, if I have a commercial gig, I like to think of like Thomas Gansch. I love the energy in his sound, but he's talking... Primarily, Jim is talking here in a classical context. I just want to bring that up because the classical sound and commercial sound are two entirely different schools. I mean, there is some cross-pollination because it is trumpet playing at the end of the day. But we need to have that model in our ears, in our, in our minds, so that we can reproduce that. And it's so important that we model the best players because that's how we're going to get the best results. I mean, if we're not exposed to what the best players sound like and we're modeling like the principal trumpet player in the local community band or your high school band, not not trying to be offensive here, but that, that's just kind of how it is, then we're not going to get as good of a result than if we were to model some of the best trumpet players in the world. So just wanted to bring that up. Two things, and, and that was it. Stay on top of the sound and don't let the mouthpiece slip down. Cool. I know, I know I'm pausing this a lot, but like I said, there's so many good things in this. So playing on top of this sound, that's a Jim Pandolfi quote for you right there. And let me show you what I think it means, my interpretation of play on top of the sound. So too many trumpet players, they think centered. They think that they need to play right at the center of that fundamental frequency of a pitch. So... What this does when we think centered, and centered is one of those vocabulary words that I think that we need to avoid from teaching and just and not thinking about that word when we play. Because when we think centered and really locking in the intonation of a specific note, we kind of think compressed. And this happens just completely involuntary, by the way. Like when we think centered, we also think compressed by default. And when we think depressed, it makes the sound thinner. It compresses the sound and it's not that ringing resonant sound that we want because we're cutting off a lot of those higher harmonics. So rather than thinking about aiming centered to that fundamental, we should be focusing more on the higher harmonics, AKA the top of the sound. Because if we, if we shift our focus to really bringing out those higher harmonics and really making that ring, it's gonna have a much better result on the sound. It's gonna make it much more resonant and ringing than if we were to think compressed and centered. So he's going to talk about this a little bit more, but 
that's my interpretation of play on top of the sound. Keep it, keep a lot of top lip in the mouthpiece. Okay. Uh, when, uh, when, uh, when Dave came to me, he was, he was floundering. And so we got him just to basically, uh, I don't know, play more efficiently. Find the sweet spot in the sound. You see, that's, yep. that, that is where most people are completely clueless. And they're clueless because of vocabulary that people use. And the vocabulary is not good. Yeah, so like I said, there's a lot of vocabulary that... I, I completely agree with Jim on this, by the way. But there's a lot of vocabulary that's used in everyday trumpet teaching that like 90% plus of trumpet teachers are still using this vocabulary. And I believe it to be kind of productive because it involuntarily makes us do bad things when it comes to creating a good sound. Like, the intentions are well. Like, they, they, the vocabulary suggests good things. However, it also involuntarily makes us do things that are going to hurt our playing. Like we said, with the word centered, when we think centered, the, the intention is good. We want good intonation, right? That's kind of what that word means. But it also makes us compress our sound when we think centered. So... If we replace some of our vocabulary, that alone is going to make us a better trumpet player. And this video is going to really dive into that more. Uh, take, for instance, the word centered. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's, well, it's a really nice word. Uh, it denotes certain good things. But I believe that the sweet spot in the sound for all the instruments, not just for the trumpet, is on top of the sound. Uh -huh. The people who... Any other non trumpet players here? Let me know in the comments. Who have it, in quotation marks, the one half of 1% of the best players in the world. Yeah. They all have that beautiful, ringing, resonant tone that just lights up. It's always perfectly in tune, and it's the most musical thing you ever heard. Yeah, so who do I think has that, that it sound that he's talking about, like that perfect trumpet sound? So, in my opinion, I think Phil Smith, Former principal of the New York Philharmonic definitely has that it sound. Um, all orchestra, most orchestral principals in the world, I don't. Most orchestral players, classical players, model Phil Smith. Like there, there's no classical trumpet player in their right mind who would say that Phil Smith doesn't have a good sound. I would say that Bud Herseth also has the it sound. I'd say Wynn Marsalis in his old his classical recordings has that it sound. I would say Maurice Andre has that it sound. And, of course, this is my opinion, right? But that's who I believe has the it sound. Um, yeah. Who are a couple examples of... And if you think I left anyone out right there, let me know down in the comments. I want to know who you think has that perfect trumpet sound. Trumpet players who would fall to that category. <coughs> Excuse me. Whitney's old recordings of the Haydn and the Hummel are absolutely fantastic. Agreed. They had the it sound. I think so. Yeah, okay. I think so. James Galway has... It. Yeah. It, it's a big, fat sound, but how he gets it is through precise precision right on top of the sound. And if you hear anything go out of tune ever with Galway, it's always just maybe two cents sharp, which is great because, like Dennis Brain said, I'd rather play a little sharp than play out of tune. So that's one of my favorite quotes ever in the trumpet world. I'd rather play a little bit sharp than out of tune. I've also heard better sharp than out of tune. So let's, let's talk about what this means. So in the world of pitch, so here's like perfectly in tune. If we were to play like perfectly with the green light and the tuner or the big happy face and tonal energy. So that, that's like in tune, scientifically speaking. But if we're just a little bit above that, if we're a little bit sharper than right in tune, we still play with that ringing and resonant sound. And if that ringing or resonant sound is still there, it's still going to sound in tune to the audience. People with really, really good ears are going to notice the difference, but it's mostly going to sound in tune and it's going to be completely okay. However, if we're a little bit flat, if we're a little bit underneath the center of the pitch, uh, it's center, I just used that word, my bad. But it takes away that tone, it takes away that resonance more than it would if we played sharp. Like, for example, if we're five cents flat below the center it's going to sound more out of tune than if we were five cents sharp and that that's just the way it is 
So we might as well aim on top of the sound and aim on the sharper side if we want to sound more in tune and play the bigger sound anyway. Too many trumpet players, they play too flat. But if, you, if you're going to play out of tune, play a little bit sharp, and you should still have that ringing resonant sound, which should make you sound in tune anyway or close enough. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay. So you find that people play too low? Always. Absolutely always. There's never a person who comes here to come play for me that just just makes a sound who's, oh, just does it. So it rings and so. You see, it's loaded with paradox. If you want to play well, it's, it's so thick with paradox. It's, it's a world of opposites. For instance, if you want to get a big sound, you have to aim small. As soon as you aim for a big sound, it goes away and you've lost. Yeah, so a really good point that he makes here is that too many trumpet players are using way too much effort to try to get a big sound. And like he's saying that if you aim past that sweet spot, if you go beyond it, it usually makes you sound worse. It makes it sound labored. It makes it sound strident and harsh. And we don't want that. We want that beautiful sound. And too many players overblow to try to get that bigger sound, or they try to play too loudly, thinking that they're going to get a bigger sound. Because somehow playing louder means we're going to get a bigger, better sound, but that's not always the case. Like, sound isn't measured in decibels. Sound is measured in, like, the color within the sound and how many overtones and harmonics are in there. But what I find is that playing with a better sound, sometimes it's a matter of scaling back. Sometimes it's a matter of stepping back and restraint a little bit that kind of pulls us back into that sweet spot. So it, it takes a lot of discipline to play this way because especially when we're playing like principal in the orchestra, for example, we really just want to go guns a-blazing. We really want to play as loud as we can sometimes. But it takes some restraint to really hit that sweet spot in the sound like he's saying. So it's a really good point that he makes there. You've gone past the sweet spot. The, okay, so if you, want, if you want a big sound, aim small. Yeah. The other thing is... Um, the only way you can get control is to let go. I mean, it's opposite all the time. Uh -huh. So what it really boils down to is to play where the note tapers itself, play Whoa. in the taper zone. So how do you find the taper zone? Everybody comes in here and plays, ah, and I get them to play like a second line G, uh -huh. play a G, and they'll play a G, and I'll say, okay, now float it, let it go, let it go, let it go to where it wants to go without manipulating it. Right. And undoubtedly, by the end of the note, as they're tapering it, the pitch of the G goes up and up and up and up, and then it settles and tapers beautifully by itself. Uh -huh. I say, so, do you feel... Yeah, so, he's saying that you should let the note go. You should let the note go where it wants to go so that it makes that beautiful ringing sound, and then it just tapers off on its own. So too many players, and I hear this all the time, when they, they're trying to center that note, they're trying to manipulate it. It's like, oh, it's, it's find the middle, oh, there it is. And there's too much physical manipulation involved, but we really just need to find that sweet spot of the sound, like he's saying, and just let it, let it go, let it sit there. Because uh, it's going to sound much more musically, and it's going to be way easier to play the less we try to manipulate the note. And if we're thinking too mechanically, if we're thinking too manipulative, it's really hard to sound musical. So let's hear more of this. Feel where that note is when you just let it go and you let it taper, you let it go all the way to the taper zone. Right. Well, start the note there. Uh -huh. And it's a very small place. See, so the sound should come from the taper and go to the taper. But most people play open-ended notes and they go, ah, and so it's open on both ends, and it sounds harsh, and it's pressed down, and it loses the beauty of the sound. See, that, that's the most important thing is the beauty of the sound. Mm -hmm. What causes people to... Yeah, so sound is the most important thing, hands down. Sound is way more important than pitch. I know that's controversial because, you know, if you hear something that's out of tune, it sounds terrible, right? But... The tone needs to come first. We need to have that beautiful ringing resonant tone because oftentimes it fixes the pitch automatically once we fix our tone. But we need to fix our tone and then we can fix pitch. 
it's not the other way around. We can't play in, in tune with the match in in tune with the tuner, but then with a bad sound because then we have to take a step backward to go forward again. Like we gotta play in, in tone before in tune is the saying. To do that, why are they all doing that? They're it? deaf, <laughs> <laughs> and they listen to people who tell them these things, and then they. And then they continue to do things even if they don't work. Well, what are these, some of these misconceptions you talk about, the most common ones that are being mistaught, incorrectly taught? Okay. Well, the three things is like breathe down low. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. That Tuba breathing, breathe down low. We talked about that earlier. Well, that's a controversial prevent one. You, prevent you from doing it. There are a lot of people who strongly disagree with that. Uh -huh. A lot of people who strongly agree with it. So, well, where does this come from? Where does it come from? It comes from how the body works naturally. Right. Okay. So, I tell people, first of all, you should be sitting up straight and pick up your chest before you begin playing. Okay. Yeah, I call this like the superhero, Superman posture. Or like, imagine like Superman standing on top of a building like being all proud, flexing his muscles, that's the kind of posture we need when we're playing trumpet. Because if we play scrunched over, if we play like, if you play like this or like this, or how so many people play the trumpet, what it does is that it decreases the volume of our lungs. It makes it so that there's more obstacles in the way of our respiratory system. We need to create, be as open as possible and give the air en enough room to travel. So that's what he's saying, like, we got to have our shoulders above our hips, good posture, pick up your chest, chest out. And that's the kind of posture we need when we're playing trumpet. Think about Superman standing on top of a skyscraper, like all proud and, you know, chest pushed out. That's kind of what we need to have. Okay. And, you know, it's a whole bunch of little stuff that makes a big difference. Yeah. So if you actually pick up your chest... Before you start playing, you see, uh, then the air can just flow in there. So if you take a breath and pick up your chest and breathe in through your nose. Yeah. All the way. So it starts down here, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's not where it ends up. Right, right. Okay. So that's just natural. That's the way it works. But to play the trumpet, a lot of people say we have to breathe a certain way and go... So when I breathe like that, you hear my voice, the it tension, it's, and the only way to get the air out is to push it out. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. So when we breathe like that, breathe down low, that like a Darth Vader, Big Bad Wolf style of breathing or like blowing up birthday candles, it creates tension. It creates unnecessarily constrictions in the body that don't need to be there. And it makes us it makes us sound like uh, like this. And that's also the way that the trumpet sounds when we breathe like this. Like we want it to be as natural as possible. We don't want, we want to be as effortless as possible at the same time. And we're also making it harder to play. Like when we breathe like that, like the only way to get that out is to blow. And blow is another one of those words we need to avoid at all costs in our vocabulary. So we need our breathing to be as natural as possible. And Jim's going to be talking about breathing like an opera singer and also breathing as if we're just having a conversation and speaking like as i'm talking to you right now i'm not thinking about my breath it's just natural and that's also what needs to be for trumpet playing like it can't be so manipulative but let's get more into it right and pushing the air out drives the tone down and it ruins the sound yeah and it pounds on your lip it just beats the hell out of your lip you once told me in a lesson, I had a lesson with you many years ago, mm -hmm. you once told me that you had a front row seat at the Met and you got to see the world's greatest singers and you saw them breathing from their chest. Always. All Always. The time. Yeah, so opera singers, they're the masters of tone production. Like, they can make the roof shake on a giant concert hall, make your ears hurt from even sitting all the way in the nosebleed seats with just their body, with just the human anatomy that they were born with. You will never ever see an opera singer using a microphone. You will never see them using any electronic amplification whatsoever. It's just their their voice. And that's why we need to model opera singers is because they're the masters of creating the best tone with just the human anatomy that they have. They always breathe in through their chest. They have their chest expanded and they're they control they they have the best breathing of any instrument. They have better breathing than any instrumentalist. Like, so that's why we need to model opera singers. Like, if an opera singer has a problem, 
they can't switch mouthpieces, they can't get new lead pipes, they can't get heavy valve caps or any of that crap. Like, they have to change what's going on here. So that's why I told trumpet players is that you need to fix yourself before you fix your equipment. Don't even think about getting a new mouthpiece until this is fixed. Make sense? Let's get more into it. Always, and you can hear it. You mm -hmm. hear it. They pick up their chest and they go. Right. Yeah, that's another good point. Like, I tell my students this too. You got to hear the pitch of the breath. Like, so many trumpet players breathe like this. It's a deep. But you need, <laughs> that, that's not the best way to play. Like I said, that creates that, that constriction that doesn't need to be there. It creates that, uh, it creates that, you know what I mean. But opera singers, when they breathe, it's a much higher pitch kind of a breath. It's like, it's like a dog panting. When I was at Ithaca, there was a professor there named Frank Campos. And he had his students do this panting exercise, like, where he would have his students literally like pant like a dog in the practice room or in, during lessons. And I had no idea why he was making people do that at the time. Like we just thought he was crazy. But after I started learning about this opera stuff and how opera singers breathe, it started to make a lot more sense because this panting breath, like a, like a dog is panting, it's very similar to the opera breathing. So, and that's why he was having the, his students do it, his trumpet students do it because it would fix their sound. So, more on this. They do not go. <gasps> That's a big difference because when I go, <gasps> I'm all stuck and I, I can't do anything. And it's, I'm choked off. Whenever I have someone come in and say, well, I'm all closed off the throat, I close off the throat. Yeah, Why? Yeah. Because you're breathing. Because of the low. breathing. Okay, because it gets stuck. On the other hand, if you take a breath with your chest up, and you fill up, right, naturally, yeah. make, make a set. Actually, I've been having much success lately with having guys make a little hissy sound in their breath uh -huh. because it does a couple of things. It engages the corners. Yeah. Most people play with a very floppy embouchure because they're making the big sound. And It's true. So if there's any, there's two parts of the body that needs to be engaged for all trumpet players. Only two. Everything else needs to be loosey-goosey and relaxed. Corners need to be firm and tight always. And the abdomen. The abdomen needs to be engaged where if someone punches you in the gut, it should hurt their hand. So what he's saying about the posture. So when you breathe like you're blowing, like the lungs, they collapse. Like they scrunch up like a pool toy that's being deflated. Like it just kind of scrunches all up. But when you have a good posture, when you have your shoulders back, your chest picked up, the lungs are fully inflated. And all it takes is a quick, and then that's all you need. The lungs are fully inflated. That way you can breathe with a lot less effort and you produce a better sound. So a big way to fix your breathing and fix your sound is just fixing your posture. Like it's so much harder to fill up the lungs when you're, it's all scrunched. Because it's so much more effort because it's like a pool toy where like it's not, it's scrunched up. It's does, it doesn't have the right shape. And then you got to blow super hard to make it form into the shape of the pool toy. So that's the magic of good posture. And you're using a lot of air and you play with the floppy embouchure. It doesn't work. What do you mean by floppy? Could you? Like soft, mushy, oh, instead of together. Oh, gotcha, mm. gotcha. You know, when, when you hear Doc Schitzer's recordings, you can hear every breath he takes, he's like, oh, every single one. And oh. he's right on top of the sound. Yeah, yeah. Right on top. Really good thing you could do. Like, try this out and it's going to blow your mind a little bit. But imagine, like, the best recordings of trumpet playing, like, the, the, the have that it sound that Jim talks about, or what you interpret as that it sound. Listen to those recordings again and see if you can hear the breath of the player. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be more of a, than a kind of a breath. So if you think I'm wrong, check it out. Let me know what you discover in the comments. So he has his voice. You see, when you play on top of the sound, then once you figure out how to play there, uh, the beauty of playing on top of the sound is 
if you stay in that taper zone where the taper lives, yeah. where the note really is alive and lives, you can brutalize the note. Yeah. And you can brutalize the note and not have it come apart. It turns to flame. It turns to burn. Mm -hmm. And when it turns to burn, that's a green light. That's right, like, right. It, that's, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Because then again, you know, Jimmy up in front smiles. I used to play as loud as I could sometimes. Uh -huh. And it was just right. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Because the tone was still beautiful instead of going, ah. What are some of these? Yeah. So tone, loudness is not always measured by decibels. Like too many people think that dynamic is a decibel level. It's like rather than sounding like a gunshot, we should sound like a space shuttle taking off. But that's not always the case. Sometimes dynamic is a measure of intensity. It's a measure of character. It's a measure of that sound intensity rather than decibels. So, and when we play loud, we can't sacrifice tone for the sake of playing loud. Because if the tone is good, if that tone is big and has that ringing resonant sound, it's going to sound loud anyway. It's going to sound bigger anyway. But if we try to play louder and break that tone, it's not actually going to sound louder. It's just going to sound, it's going to be a worse tone that's slightly more projected. So that's my two cents on that. These are the misconceptions that are okay. commonly taught. You okay. the breathing. All right. Uh, uh, the, there are three things. Breathe down low. Yeah. Say ah or oh. All right. So this is, this is another one. So we had a master class with Wayne Bergeron back in February. I have this master class series is called Trumpet Legends. There's might be links in the description if you want to check that out. I know it's for sure it's on my Instagram bio. But we had this master class with Wayne Bergeron and he was talking about the opera stuff too. And he actually learned the opera stuff from Maynard Ferguson. So what he was saying is that Opera singers are who you should model for tone. And he was talking about like high notes at the time. Like he was talking about like how Maynard Ferguson plays those high ballads that are way up in the stratosphere but still have a really nice warm tone. But he compares this to opera singing because too many trumpet players, they think about tongue placement when it comes to playing high notes. Like when we play high, we got to go, oh, yeah. Uh, ee, like that's how we play highs with that tongue manipulation however with opera singing you got to keep in mind that they need to sing different words sometimes so if an opera singer needs to sing a high note it they can't always go e because what if the word is ah what if they have to sing an ah vowel but they have to do it with a high note then they can't go oh because that's not the right vowel right so Jim's going to talk about this, about why we shouldn't be using vowels when it comes to creating differences on the trumpet. So your mouth, oh. As you're breathing oh. in. As you're breathing in? No, as you're setting, as like when, when you're producing a tone, say, oh, 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 I see. To make a big sound. Yeah, yeah. And um, what's the third thing? Oh, yeah, use more air. Uh -huh. That's the problem solver. Use more air. Biggest myth ever in the trumpet world is use more air. He's going to really tear this apart, but I just want to forewarn you. I know it's an extremely commonly dished out piece of advice. You've probably heard it several times throughout your trumpet playing development, but we're going to destroy it today if, it ha if we haven't destroyed it for you already, but let's get into it. So we have, a, we have teaching for years and years that says breathe down low, Say so R or O, and when you run into problems, use more air. Uh -huh. It's all wrong, all of it. You gotta breathe naturally, yep. and you have to say E, E all the time. Mm -hmm. You have to say E all the time. You know, in the Arvin book, it says the pronunciation, right? It says two, 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 two. Yeah. Well, Dave Gordon in Seattle, the principal trumpet of Seattle, reminded me that it's a French book. The right. Arvin's book is a French book, and indeed, yeah. the pronunciation for two is chi. Yeah. Yep, this is a big one. This is a really big one. Because most trumpet players, they pronounce T-U in the Arvin's book as two. Two is how you pronounce it. 
But what most don't realize is that that's an Americanized pronunciation of that word. So Arben is French. Jean-Baptiste Arben. That's a French name. It was a French book. This guy was speaking the French language and had that French dialogue. Like the way that people speak around the world is very different. Like the 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 way that French pronoun the 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 French accent is very different than an American accent where whatever part in the world that you're from. So we need to model the author. We need to model the way that he speaks and the way that his tongue moves and everything. So Jim is saying that the pronunciation of the word two according to John Baptiste Arbin, because that's the way he would say it, it was tiu, tiu. It's got like a Y. It's not a U, it's got more of like a Y vowel. Tiu, tiu, tiu. And when you say that word, the back of the tongue goes up, kind of makes like a V with the tongue, and it has that little buzzing ring sound when you say that. Ti, like do you hear that high ringing? Ti, as opposed to tu, e. So that. That's how we create that that ringing sound is with that 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 vowel by saying tu instead of two. But let's hear more about this. Yeah. Tiu, tiu. Now you say that tiu, tiu, tiu. Tiu. and what happens is you, it creates a V in your tongue, doesn't it? Yeah. Tiu. And the the tip of your tongue goes down behind your bottom teeth, yeah. and your tongue turns into a V and it goes forward. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll hear some people call this anchor tonguing where you have the tip of your tongue kind of resting behind your bottom teeth. And that kind of turns the tongue into this, uh, into this kind of V shape where the back of the tongue is elevated closer to the roof of your mouth. And that's what creates that, that pronunciation. So, and then to articulate, you're kind of using like a flat of your tongue right there and that's gonna hit against your gums. So this is misconception that we need to articulate with the tip of our tongue. So I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Like I prefer to keep the tongue behind the bottom teeth like that, anchor tonguing, if you will. Think of it at like the Chicago. I have Pete, when I was studying with Pete, he called it the Chicago speech impediment. Like I'm going to the game to see the bears, the bears, where it's like a D instead of the T H in the the word the. So if I can get closer to the camera, like it's like. Tip of the tongue is anchored behind the teeth. Da, 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 da. Like I'm not articulating with the tip of the tongue. It's more of like the, the flat part of the tongue right there. Yeah. Tongue forward. That's what, that's what everyone has to do. That's where high notes come. That's where... Some people also call this dorsal tonguing. Like think about the dorsal fin of a dolphin. Where it's like the tongue is... The tongue is not down. Like by say this is like the bottom of the oral cavity like the tongue is not flat like this it's more forward like jim is saying like a, a dorsal fin on a dolphin or efficiency com efficiency comes from yeah so uh again you know take t breathe down low say oh oh and use more air wrong wrong and wrong you do one <laughs> of them you can't play you do all three of them they're trifecta you complete basket case <laughs> so, <laughs> which is what most people. It's funny because, like, he's about to say that's how most people teach the trumpet, and it's 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 controversial, I know, but it yields really good results, especially if you're struggling using this vocabulary. If you've been taught to use your air, use more air your entire life, and it's still not creating the sound that you want, maybe it's time for a new approach. Just saying. So let's keep going. People do, yeah. What most people do, yeah. So. Uh, I've had people tell me, uh, you know, it's about where the note lives, where the sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. And people say, I would have never, ever in a million years thought to look on top of the sound to find the sweet spot. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought in a million years because everyone says centered. And then some people say that the sweet spot is on the bottom of the sound. So you get a ah. But that's not the trumpet. The trumpet should be sounding like a trumpet. It's got to be brilliant. Can you? And you yeah. So trumpet is different than these low register instruments like tuba, for example, with the tuba breath. Um, it, we're a soprano instrument. We're the soprano of the brass family. We need those high frequencies to really sound like a good trumpet sound. So, and like you said, like 
the vocabulary, the wrong vocabulary is so mainstream. So it's true that most people wouldn't look for that sweet spot. They would just pl try to play centered because that's what the mainstream language says. It's kind of like it's it's common sense to most people to play centered. So it's really hard to break those bad habits when you've been playing that way for decades. And it's completely understandable. And I understand why it might frustrate a lot of people. You've got to come in on the white horse and yeah. take some heads, swing in the sword once in a while. Could you give me an example of just so people can see it on camera of just a setup, a breath and an air attack just right here without a trumpet? You see, when I was at the Met, I would always, especially when I had something that was important for me to play yeah. that I was nervous about, I would always finish my breaths through my nose. It, oh, really? Uh-huh. It, it, it was an insurance policy Joel for me. Joel has a horn here if you want it. Okay, if you want awesome. It. it was an insurance policy for me that uh, I would have the right resistance, the proper setup and the resistance and the support and it gave me time to get my lip in the mouthpiece. Yep. And uh, that's what I would do. So, I, you see, more and more. I so something I tell my students, and this isn't completely related to what he's talking about, but something I tell my students is that when you do this opera style breathing, it's okay if a little bit of air sneaks in through the nose because that it might happen naturally. But, of course, we're not going to do a nose breath and force it. Like... <sighs> We're not going to be doing anything like that. But if we take that opera breath, a little, you might feel a little bit of air sneaking in the nose, and that's okay. We just got to let the body do what it naturally wants to do. But back to this. I'm, I'm trying to get guys to breathe through their face instead, like the whole thing. Oh. Breathe through your nose, breathe through the corners of your mouth. Okay, now he's going to say it. But we got we to gotta do what's natural, like... Don't breathe in through the mouth, just the mouth, breathe in through the face. So that's going to include the nose, the corners, maybe even imagine that the air is coming into your eyeballs too, breathing in like the entire mask. Um, it's going to make us breathe a lot more naturally than if we're, because if we breathe through just the mouth, we get that blowing style breath, that breathe down low, birthday cake, candle style breath. We don't want that. We want this singing style breath that we're talking about here. Mouth go. So it's always like, So you took the last bit through your nose there. Yeah, yeah that's there. And that's it. what you're going for is you want the inhale to be roughly the same as the exhale. Well, you, that brings me to a point. Uh, okay, good. That brings me to a great point because I'll, I'll ask guys if, when they come here, do you, do you have a physical sensation of air leaving your body when you're playing? They're like, yeah. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Do you have a physical sensation of air leaving your body when you're speaking? Right? I just finished the sentence and I was completely out of air. Yeah. Take another breath. But d do I feel it going out as I'm speaking? No. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only way that the air comes out of your body is through the resonance and the ring of your tone. Yeah, this is, this is gold right here. So, like you said, when you're speaking, do you feel air leaving your body? Do you feel physical sensation of air leaving your body? Like when you're speak, you're not blow when you're speaking, you're not blowing. What you're doing is that you're vibrating the vocal cords and as you speak, air slowly starts to escape the body. And then at the end of something you're going to say, like I'm saying a run on sentence right now, I'm completely out of breath. But you don't, you don't really notice it un unless you're looking for that. So trumpet playing needs to be the same way because too many people blow. Too many trumpet players blow and they, they, they're blowing air. But what they need to be doing is more like singing. It needs to be more of just creating that tone, not even thinking about air leaving the body, not even thinking about exhaling. And then the, 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 the lungs are going to run out of its air on its own, just like as we were to speak. But as soon as we switch to blowing, as soon as we switch to purposely making air leave our body, it's going to trigger the blowing muscles. And then we're not going to play efficiently. This It's going to kill the sound. It's not going to get that efficient, beautiful sound that we're looking for. And it's going to help our endurance big time too when we play this way. Because we're going to run out of breath a lot less quickly when we have this kind of approach. Because when we blow, we empty the lungs way too quickly. So this style of exhaling is a lot more efficient. Right, right. Of your voice. Mm-hmm.
so if I were to play, if I were to speak like most people play the trumpet, mm -hmm. it would sound something like <laughs> this because they blow on every goddamn note. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so yeah. when I take breath, okay, and that's another thing it, that is that people like to breathe in rhythm also. They love to go one, two. It's another big one. I know like, I, I agree with this and I kind of disagree with this. Like, like I said, Jim Pandolfi, he's probably got the closest teaching philosophy to my own personal philosophy of any other trumpet teacher. But this is one thing that I might slightly disagree with him, just because breathing is a really good communication tool, especially if we're playing in a brass quintet, for example. Like, a properly timed breath can make or break an ensemble, could really make or break the synchronization of a chamber group. We're even just playing in an orchestra, like a properly timed breath can cue the entire section, where even just playing in a big band, a properly timed breath can make the section playing time with each other and that's where that comes in handy but what he's going to say is that like timing your breath like this it's going to make breathing unnatural and it's going to affect the sound which also has truth to it so let, let's hear what he has to say and i'm like wow that is really not good mm -hmm. why because it reinforces the suck blow yeah because Oh, I like to tell my guys once I get to know them and once they start understanding what I'm talking about. Yeah. If you blow, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> my job when someone comes. Viewer discretion is advised. To see me is to get any semblance of blow out of their playing. Yeah. And replace it with sing and with musicality. Yeah. So. That's the whole philosophy in a nutshell, is that we don't blow when we play trumpet, we sing. The B word, we can't use the B word because that triggers blowing muscles. If we want to sing, it uses the lungs in a completely different way. It uses our posture in a completely different way. That creates a better, more resonant sound with less effort. And that's a win-win right there. Would you rather play with less effort with a more beautiful sound? Or would you rather play with more effort with a worse sound? Like, there, there's no other way, so... Yeah. And artistry is as opposed to note processing, where you go one, two, three. So you want to work with the resistance of the instrument. You, exactly. If there's no resistance pushing back at you, see, okay, thank you. You're the, welcome. One of the, <laughs> you're, you're egging me on. This is great. See, when you play the way that I want you to play, yeah. I want you to play on top of the sound with pinpoint accuracy. You see, what it boils down to it, it's two things. You play in the taper zone, where the note lives, yep. where it is alive, mm -hmm. okay? That's on top of the sound. Yeah. We can argue about that till the cows come home, right. but it's on top of the sound for singers, it's on top of the sound for the best fiddle players in the world, it's on top of the sound for best flute players, the clarinet players. Right. Yeah, even if you're not a trumpet player, this philosophy, it's true. Like we got to aim for those higher harmonics that really make the sound ring rather than thinking centered. Even if you're not a trumpet player, this stuff is gold. Sabina Meyer, she plays on top of the sound. Every note she plays on the clarinet is perfectly, perfectly in tune. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy hearing her play. That's why I enjoy hearing her play because she makes me smile. Yeah. When I hear other players really doing it, it brings that involuntary reaction from the listener. They break out into a smile. Yeah. And when you hear someone with it who's playing in the orchestra, they get your full attention and you're like, wow. And you can raise the hairs on the back of your neck. Right, That's right. what I'm talking about. Yeah, it really makes a big difference. It's not just a subjectively better sound. If you're in the audience and you really hear that it sound, like it'll give you goosebumps. It'll like give you tingly sensations in your arms and in your, in your everything that really moves and that's like the musical impact that we want i mean there there's there's musicians who just sound good and are pleasing to the ears but there's some moments in music where it just makes your entire body kind of like give you goosebumps and that's just only the best musicians in the world can make you feel that way in my opinion and that that's something we all need to strive for
Yeah, yeah. The beautiful musical experience, okay? Uh -huh. And that's only created if you produce a viable tone, a real tone, a specific thing, a tone has resonance, it has ring, it's perfectly in tune, and it takes on a life of its own. Yeah. I like to say it's more like surfing than note processing, because once you have the resistance established and the sound established and it's ringing and it's vibrant, then it's a matter of can you concentrate well enough to make it from the beginning all the way through your thing and then and then you're done. It's like you play the phrase. It's just you burn the music. That's a really good analogy that I like, where it's like when you're surfing, you're, you're trying to find how to stay on top of that wave. You're trying to get to the top of the wave, try to keep your bounce. And then once you're there, it's a matter of staying as bounced as you can, as long as you can, until the wave crashes down. So that's kind of how music is, is that you're looking for that sweet spot, and then once you're there, you're trying to stay there all the way until the end of the phrase, until you're done playing. And you're trying to keep your bounce and stay there as long as you can. So I really like that analogy. You surf, you're surfing on top of that sound and you're trying to stay there right until the end of the phrase. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like you flip the switch. Okay, here, here it comes. I'm going to flip the switch now. I'm about to play. Click. You're still burning. Right. Still burning. Still burning. Still burning. Done. Click. <laughs> wow, that was hard. I like how he was talking about creating this intense sound. It was messing with the microphone. I uh, know that that was kind of funny to me, but but they, they're when you get this right sound, like I, you can hear the microphone clipping sometimes. Like there's this video of Chris Martin playing um, from Mouse Towards None from Lincoln, right when that piece was written. Uh, it's a, for solo trumpet and piano, but. There's moments in his Chris Martin's recording where the microphone sounds like it's clipping, where like the frequencies of Chris Martin's playing is too much for the microphone and it's interfering with it. So well, once you have the it sound, sometimes it might mess with uh, the, the microphone. So that, that's kind of funny. <laughs> Let's try a segment if we could. I would like to ask you, I've got a list of like seven or eight things here. If you could brief uh, basically trumpet techniques. All right, so spoiler alert, he's going to name these different fundamentals, and Jim is going to answer every single one of them with, if you have a better tone, then this is going to improve. If you have a better tone, then this is going to improve. If you have a better tone, then this is going to improve. So when you fix your tone, you fix everything. So you got to start with that base of the pyramid. If you want better upper register, fix your tone. If you want better articulations, fix your tone. If you want to play better in tune, fix your tone. But let's, Jim's going to dive deeper into this. And ideas. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give me just a brief um, few words about what you think about them, how students should go about practicing them and so forth. Okay. Uh, we've already covered the first one, basically tone. The second one, articulation. Oh, again, if you put your tone first, mm -hmm. your articulations are going to be better. Right. I've had experiences where uh, guys come in here and they say, well, I've been working on my tonguing for like a month, six weeks. I'm like, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you had trouble tonguing, but okay. <laughs> well, what have you been tonguing? What have you been practicing? Oh, I've been doing the Goldman book and that, 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 that. Okay, well, well, show me what you've been doing. Let's hear it. And so they start doing it and I'm like, no, nah, that doesn't sound very good. And and then I, I try to play it and I can't play it either and that doesn't sound very good <laughs> and in two minutes I can't tongue anymore and I... There's a little teacher moment right there like when you're trying to really explain something to a student and then you're overthinking how you play and then it gets in the way of your own playing because you're trying to teach it. It's happened to me before where I'm trying to really over explain something and then when I try it I'm overthinking it and then I can't play it anymore. It's happened to me and it, this makes me laugh. I yell at the kid and I say, look what you did to me. Now I can't tongue either. Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> look what you've done. So, uh, tonguing is a thing. Okay, you got to be able to tongue a whole bunch of different ways according to what you need to do musically. And it all comes back to tone production, really. And it all comes... It all goes back to tone production, exactly. Back to... 
don't fuck up the tone. <laughs> yeah. If you let the tone lead, uh, again, uh, I lose track. If all your energy is, is just all your concentration just put into the effort of making the most resonant, ringing tone you possibly can, mm -hmm. then all, all is going to be well in the universe. Everything, right, right. all your physical ducts line up in a row because you're making the resonant ringing sound. You see, right. it's the ring and the sound that makes your chops work great. Yeah. And it's not the chops working great that puts the ring in the sound. Yeah. You know what puts the ring in your sound? Willpower. If yeah. you can hear it, you can do it. And this goes back to when you're trying to make that ringing resonant sound that you really need to have someone else's tone in your mind. Like if you're playing principal in an orchestra, you really need to have, like, for example, Phil Smith's sound in your mind. Because it's so hard to model, it's so hard to have a good sound if you have nothing to model off of. Like you really need to know exactly how Phil Smith would do it so that you can create that in your own playing. Having that willpower, if you would. Well, like if you're thinking too much about chops, like you said, and too much mechanically speaking, it's so hard to get that, that result. Mm -hmm. If you can't hear it, you can't do it. And that's where the different levels of talent come into play. And you mentioned taping yourself as well earlier off camera. Yeah. So talent, I'm going to disagree with Jim on this as well, but this is all something that can be trained. This is all something that someone can be coached to do. Um, it's just a matter of, like I said, it's a matter of uh, it's practice. If you, matter of discipline and practice, of course. I mean, you're not going to be a good trumpet player if you can't practice. Uh, and it's just a matter of psychology, too. Like, if you have the willpower, like he says. But that's something that can be trained. Like, mindset is definitely something that can be coached. So, like, too many people hide behind, oh, I'm just not talented, I cannot do that. I don't have the natural talent. But to me, natural talent is BS. Like, anything can be trained if you work hard enough. Um, hopefully that's inspiring. Yeah, I, I did it uh, sparingly, but mm -hmm. whenever I did do it, I was like, wow, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really important. It was really valuable tool for you, the taping. Yes, it was. It was, it was important taking auditions and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a few. I have a feeling you're going to answer most of these the same way, so I'll skip those. But I fix your tone. This is going to be better. Exactly. I have a few that I think are maybe on a slightly different topic. What about uh, time? If you're having problems with it, you should you should use a metronome. And I'm an anti subdivision person. Oh, interesting. I go the other way uh, because I think. With me, the time is inside of me, and it, I, it just grooves, and it grooves better when something's in a fast four, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll feel it in two. When something's in three, I'll feel it in one. I'll feel the bigger picture rather than the one E and a two E and a one E and a two E and a. Yeah, so this is a really good point. I mean, there, there's merit to both ways of thinking. I mean, I know a lot of great with rhythmically talented musicians who are thinking with the subdivision like the one in and two in and one in and two in or they're thinking even further they're subdividing in 16th notes or 32nd notes even so but going the other way the whole reverse subdivision is really good as well because it actually makes you think harder it's like what i call it reverse training wheels where the training wheels it lets you get away with bad habits like it, it, it self corrects the bike, but if you take the if imagine an alternate universe where you put training wheels on that made the the bike harder to ride. Like, it makes you think more. It makes you more accountable. For example, like if you set a metronome to just click on beat one, it's like click two, three, four, click two, three, four, click two, three, four, click. It makes you subdivide in your head beats two, three, and four. It makes you think more. And you can take it a step further. Say, make the click every beat one of every other measure. Click, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Click, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
click really gets you to think more. If we have the metronome beating every single beat, and even worse, beating every single subdivision every single beat, it makes our brain turn off. It makes it so that we don't need to think as much because we have this crutch that's doing the subdivision for us. But if we take the crutch away, it gets us to think more, it trains our brain more. So that when we, when we do actually play in the performance, our brain is actually trained rather than having this crutch. Uh, you can take it a step further, have it click on not beat one. One, two, click, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, click, four. You can make it on the subdivision. One and two and three and four click. One and two and three and four click. One and two and three and four click. It really gets you to think. When I was in college, we had this director. He's a drummer. Go figure. We're talking about time here, but he had the he had the entire band play like this, where the click was just on one specific part of the measure, but it was on the end of two, for example, and it was swung. So. It really made us internalize the swing and made the entire band really internalize that swing feel so that we're all feeling that that same groove do da la do da click do do da do da do da da do da click do da do da da do da da do da click do da do da So if you really want to get good at rhythm, I highly suggest this kind of an exercise Really because I can't see the forest for the trees when I go one iana two iana interesting I go the other way. What about pitch? Pitch is completely taken care of when you make your beautiful ringing resonant tone. In tone before in tune. Fix your tone before you fix your intonation. Because when you fix your tone, you're going to figure out that the intonation sort of automatically fixes itself. So don't think centered first. There's the centered word again. But too many players, they think in tune first. And then the, their sound sounds gray. It doesn't, it's not ringing. It's kind of like a laser. But... No one likes a laser tone. We want that big resonant sound. So the tone needs to come first, and then we can adjust pitch after we create that resonant tone. Yeah. It's, and, and the beauty of doing that is that when we play this way, there's no manipulation involved. No manipulation of the lips, no manipulation of the pitch. You let it go, and you let it sail to where it wants to go. So, I, sorry for interrupting a lot, but there's really two ways you can think about pitch. You can think about playing vertically, which is like you're centering each individual note, you're reaching up to each note, or you can think horizontally. When you think horizontally, it's more musical, there's less manipulation. When you think vertically, like making sure each pitch is centered, it doesn't sound as musically, and there's too much manipulation in, in the sound. And that comes across to the audience as less musical. So we got to think more horizontally. We got to think more big picture. Sound comes first. What's the proper way to use a, um, a tuner? Throw it away. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You... Yep. This is a big one. This is huge. We got to tune with our ears and not our eyes. This is a big problem. Like people rely on that tuner, and they're they're trying to get the needle to hit the green light where they're trying to get the big smiley face on tonal energy but we're not training the right part of our body we're not training the right sense rather than using a tuner and training our eyes because when we take the tuner away a lot of players can't play in tune once they don't see the tuner anymore then they can't play in tune but if they train their ears instead they're going to be able to play in tune in the context of an ensemble or just playing in tune with themselves even. So throw away the tuner, like he says, and just work with drones. You gotta be able to hear and play in tune relative to a reference pitch. That's how you're gonna play in tune with an ensemble, not by staring into a tuner. Wow. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh-huh. I, yeah, I, I never owned one, and occasionally, you know, in the pit, somebody would be playing around with it, and if I had, a, I had to, uh, tune up my rotary trumpet or something you know i tell them to take a look see where i was uh -huh. if i was in the ballpark yeah. but that's about all it's use, useful for yeah so a tuner if you're trying to find 440 before a gig or a rehearsal if you're just trying to tune to 440 or whatever the ensemble is tuning to whatever frequency it's good for that just finding out if you're going to be in tune before the band starts playing but other than that 
it's not good. Interesting. You're okay. For it. Uh, I've, I've had people call me up and say, uh, it's two weeks after a lesson. Jim, I'm, I'm doing great. It feels fantastic. I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, my range is great. My endurance is great. But when I, when I go up to a G on top of the staff, well, maybe it's just two cents sharp. What should I do? I said, sounds great, right? Yeah. Feels great, right? Yeah. Throw the fucking tuner out. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it out. Yeah. So better sharp than out of tune, though, like you said. Like, if you're a two or three cents sharp and you have a great sound, it doesn't really matter, honestly. Like, it's still going to sound good at the end of the day. But two or three cents flat, on the other hand, that's when we start to have a problem. But if it sounds good at the end of the day, that's what matters. Like, it, two in tune sometimes sounds unnatural. It doesn't sound human if everything's, like, perfectly zeroed in. So, keep that in mind. Yeah. Next one, you ready? Yeah. Musicianship. If you're making a beautiful tone, you can be a musician. Oh. Did you see that one coming? If you don't make a beautiful tone, you're a note processor. And you can play at the music as much as you want, but you're not going to be in it. Yeah. It's a connective. You see, when you make a beautiful tone, a viable tone, a real tone, and not a sound, because... That's the sound, you know, tone yeah, yeah, yeah. is specific. Uh, when you make a beautiful tone, it's a transcendental experience. It changes everything. It mm -hmm. turns you from, it's magic. Oh, I wanted to hear the analogy. I was so excited. It, it, I don't know. It's just, it's magic. It, <laughs> yeah. I it's understand. magic. It turns you from somebody who's trying to operate this thing. Tuku, 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 right? Yeah, that's kind of the goal. Like, we want to play as less mechanically as possible and play as musically as we can. And you, you'll hear this. You'll hear someone playing trumpet and it just sounds like music. It sounds like someone's singing into a brass instrument. Then you'll hear other people play and it sounds like they're just processing notes. They're just slotting the notes and it's more mechanical. So... We're musicians. Our goal should be to play musically. And that that's sort of the goal that we're trying to get here. So I know I interrupt a lot. Part of the reason is because I don't want YouTube to flag me. So I need to interrupt every now and then. Um, just so I stay compliant with YouTube. So being transparent, that was the main reason for this one. But let's keep going. Mm -hmm. To this being a complete extension of you, part of you. It, it, it is, becomes you. Right, right. It's no longer plumbing. Yeah. This is plumbing. And if you make a beautiful, beautiful tone on it and you find some balance and resistance and make, you know, then it becomes, then you become the instrument. There right, it is. Right, you right, see, right. you're the instrument and not this thing. Yeah. Oh, this we are the instrument. We are the musician who happens to use a trumpet as a means of expression. So this is. This is the instrument. This is just a little amplifier of the instrument. That's the way I like to think about it. Like imagine that this is the guitar and this is the guitar amp. Conditioning, and maybe more along the terms of how it relates to, I don't know, nerves mm -hmm. or stage fright, that type of thing. Take Inderol, don't leave home without it. <laughs> Got it. Propanol. For... Okay, propanol. So you don't need drugs and beta blockers to take care of performance anxiety. I mean, it's consult with a doctor. I'm not a doctor, but it might help some people. But there's actual proven mindset training that you can do without the help of these things to help you with performance anxiety stuff. And this is the topic I love talking about. I have a video on this exact topic. Um, love to make more videos about performance anxiety because it's something I'm passionate about. I used to have terrible performance anxiety myself. Like the very first solo recital I ever gave, awful. And it was because I was too nervous. So I, it's something that I like helping other people out with because I've had bad experiences with it myself. Oh, well. It's yeah. cheaper. It's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> um, that covers pretty much all those. Um, I want to get back. Audition, uh, auditions? Well, yeah. You, wanna... you have to claim the job for yourself in your mind before you even show up. There you go. Some mindset stuff. Like you gotta be so freaking confident. You gotta own it. Uh, you can't. You can't 
have this presence like you're walking into someone else's house. Like, because that's going to make you bashful. It's going to make you play more conservatively when we really need to play our heart out in an audition. So you got to have that ego. I know trumpet ego is something that's a little frowned upon, but for an audition, you got to have an ego. you got to show up like you're the best player in the room, and you got to have that confidence. So he's going to talk more about this. Okay. You have to know you're going to be the best guy. You have to go in there and say check this shit out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is how i'm going to play and if you don't like it that's fine but apathy too apathy is another really good tool for um keeping your composure when you're either performing or at an audition so if you don't like it that's cool i don't care it's a good way to put it or like if another way to use apathy is like if i miss this note the sun isn't going to explode. The sun is going to come up the next day. The world is going to keep spinning and everything's going to be fine. I'm still going to be healthy. I'm so, still going to have a beating heart. So if I miss this note, it doesn't matter. It's, it's fine. And when you give yourself permission to make mistakes like that, when you let yourself being okay with making mistakes, then it's much less likely that you're going to make them. But... On the other hand, if you're thinking, oh my god, oh my god, I gotta hit that high note at the end of the excerpt, I gotta make sure I hit it, otherwise I'm gonna be out of a job, then you, it's so hard to be successful with that mindset, especially playing trumpet when anything can happen. Like, notes can crack even if you practice it a thousand times. It happens. You have to go, well, it depends on your personality, but for me, I knew I was gonna win before I went. Mm hmm. In my mind. Yeah, you were that confident. On stage. We interviewed Mike Roylance. Do you know Mike? He was a tuba no. player. He's a tuba player with the Boston Symphony. Mm -hmm. And he, he remembers distinctly on stage, I think it was in the finals, for the Boston Symphony tuba audition, his dream job. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting there thinking to himself in between excerpts. He actually caught himself thinking, the uh, financial future of my wife and child depend on how I'm going to play this next excerpt. And then he had to stop himself. Mm -hmm. But he was th those kind of thoughts creep in. Yeah. So, if you approach an audition with the mindset of, like, everything has to be 100% perfect, otherwise I'm not going to be able to feed my family, I'm not going to be able to provide, I'm not going to be able to play music for a living, or if I don't play 100% perfectly, I'm going to be driving Uber instead or waiting tables. Ugh, it's not going to turn out the way that you want it to. So, I talk about the 80% rule with my students. Rather than expecting 100% perfection, aim for 80% instead. That way, if you miss up, if you miss a note, you're down to 99%. Your goal is 80%, so you're still crushing it if you're still at 99 I know Phil Smith cracked some notes during his New York Thriller Morning Audition. It happens. But he, the reason why he won probably is because he kept his composure. He just moved on. Like, during my last seating audition in college, I had a huge crack. I was playing the Dvorak 9 excerpt. Ba, 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 that one. And then when it switched octaves, I cr had a huge crack on that very first note. But I, I kept my composure and I played the rest of the excerpt flawlessly. And if I didn't keep my composure, the rest of the excerpt would have sounded terrible. So even though I had that huge crack, I still won the audition. I got first chair in the orchestra. So how you handle yourself like this during an audition, how you, the mindset that you approach it with can make or break it. It makes a huge difference. It could be the result of winning and losing. Listen, when I won the job at the Met, I was having, I was, I was principal trumpet in Oklahoma Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. I, it was my fourth year there. The fourth year, we went on strike and the orchestra folded. So I was out of work for like 10 months, living in Oklahoma, yeah. going blind, wearing a telescopic device to read my music. Uh, <laughs> I had a, f uh, a baby about to turn four. Oh, man. Uh, I was under a lot of pressure. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Just confidence? Uh, I don't know. Was it a uh, false confidence you brought to the audition? No, no. I was stressed. <laughs> yeah. I was stressed. But uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I'd been to so many. I mean, I'd been runner-up six times. Oh, really? Yeah, every time the, the screen comes down, they see my telescope and the ball and the, and the alarm bells went off. So. Yeah, so if you didn't know that about Jim, he had this problem with his eyesight where he was pretty much almost legally blind. We're, we're legally blind. Like, I, I don't know personal details like that. But if you see old pictures of Jim, he has this, like, this big, it looks like a telescope, exactly like he's saying. And then, as he's going to tell you, like, the, the HR department and these orchestras had concerns where they didn't want to hire him because of it. So, let's hear him talk about it. Oh, I never seriously? Got, I never got hired. Uh, so, the Met had a, a, a screen through the finals. Really? And that's, that's why they hired me. Wow. Because they had no idea. Interesting. And uh, and then the personal manager said, well, what's up? And I said, well, you know, I got this thing and uh, give me two years just like everyone else. Then decide whether you want to keep me on or not. Yeah. And he was agreeable to that. And yeah, so I had I eked wow. out 15 years. So. Wow. It's, it's a miracle I had any of them. <laughs> I want to get actually. to my favorite question for all these interviews. Okay. How did you get good at the trumpet? Uh... Uh, I really worked hard once I got out of college. After college is when you got yeah, good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, had... where was your schooling at? I don't even know. Yeah, so it's kind of inspiring. So some of these players, they weren't always good. They weren't always great from the first day they picked up the trumpet. Like, I know there's prodigies out there. There are, there are people playing incredibly since they were five years old. Like Wynn Marsalis and Sergei Nikarikov, for example, child prodigy trumpet players. But some of these players, they had their problems. They weren't always good. And then they they got good because of sheer hard work. So it's a lesson for us all that is you don't have to have that natural talent if you want to be one of the best players in the world. Uh, I went to University of Connecticut for two years, and I went to Juilliard for three years. Well, you don't get into, I mean, Connecticut's a good school, and Juilliard's obviously an amazing school. You don't get into those without being pretty good to start with. Uh, I, I was okay in high school, but, you know, I, I, I had an amazing transformation after my uh, freshman year in college. Mm -hmm. I went down to uh, Easter Music Festival down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It was the summer of 1977. I was 19. I met Winton Marsalis there. He, Winton was there. He was oh, 15. Really? Yeah. Have you been to Eastern Festival? Let me know down in the comments if you ever attended that one. I've never went to the Eastern myself. I've been to Miami, Miami Music Festival, and I've been to Sewanee. That's where I studied with Pete Pond. But what music festivals have you gone to? Let me know in the comments if you have been to any. It's the first time I met Winton. And, uh, and uh, the trumpet teacher was some, a guy named John McElroy, who plays first okay. trumpet in Alabama. All right. And he's a terrific player. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I was playing on a, a 5C all through high school. Mm -hmm. And I had no range, no tone, no endurance. I was, I was not doing well. So I'm not a mouthpiece guy. Like, if any of one of my students start talking about mouthpieces, I wish I had this, like, I wish they were wearing like a shock collar, like a dog, and if they start talking about mouthpieces, they go because my my priority is to get them playing with impeccable technique. Like I said, fix this before you fix your equipment. Um, but if I do say anything about mouthpieces, this is what I'm gonna say. So let's hear. Let's just hear it from Jim. Mm -hmm. And uh, and John McElroy had the, all the trumpet students for the for the camp, about eight of us, I guess, in his, in his room. And you know where his audition was? His audition was, okay, everybody got out your horns. Just play a high C as loud as you can. You, play a high C. <laughs> you, play a high C. <laughs> you, high C. He gets the wit and wit and goes. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, wow, it's kids. That's really funny. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, the point of this story is that I was having a lesson with Big John and he was looking at my mouthpiece and he's looking at it and he just took it and grabbed it and he pulled it out of the horn and he stuck it in his pocket. And he took out a 1C and he plugged it in the horn and I started looking at it and he, and he berated me, called, the, called me a pussy and uh, <laughs> told me that I'm going to be playing that mouthpiece for the rest of the summer. Wow. And I said, oh, really? I just felt like a toilet bowl. 
Yeah, so a 1C is a huge mouthpiece. Is, that's a huge mouthpiece. So the smaller the number, the bigger the rim size. So I had a similar experience where I had a teacher who put me on a Manette mouthpiece because this... The teacher I had, not going to say names, but he played an all Monet trumpet, had Monet mouthpieces, even for his piccolo was a Monet mouthpiece. Every he just all Monet. Maybe he was like an affiliate or an ambassador of the Monet brand. I don't know. But I was playing with a Monet, and then I went to study with another teacher, and he just looks at the Monet and he's like, "You are not playing on that." So he had me switch to a one and a quarter C, a Bach one and a quarter, big mouthpiece. I think I was playing on like the equivalent of a 3C for the Monets. And it was a big mouthpiece, but it made a drastic difference to my tone. And it's the mouthpiece I still play on today, Bach 1 and a quarter C. It's got a 24-25 hollowed out backboard too. So the teacher I was studying with was so passionate about this that he actually sold me one of his mouthpieces. He's like, you're not playing on that Monet. Here's one of my mouthpieces. And then... I gave him money for it. So that's what I play on to this day. Yeah. But uh, so I went from a 5C to a 1C, and within five days, my range went up five or six notes, my wow. endurance got better, and my sound went from eh to. Wow. So, yeah. So what my message attribute? is Yeah, what do you attribute that to? Play the largest mouthpiece that you can, you, that you can handle. Because I so obviously not true for all contexts of trumpet playing. For the classical world, for the orchestral trumpet playing world, this is this is gold because that's going to give you that huge sound that you're looking for, especially for that kind of a context. However, commercially speaking, if you're playing lead in a big band, obviously this wouldn't make sense. Like we had a master class with Louis Dowdswell um, back in December of 2022. And he was talking about gear and mouthpieces. And he was saying that the complete opposite, essentially, is that we got to play in the smaller pieces and that it makes a huge difference, especially for lead trumpet playing. So like I said, classical trumpet playing and commercial trumpet playing are two completely different schools of sound. There is some cross-pollination, but especially when we're talking about equipment and mouthpieces, take things with a grain of salt, especially if you're not if you don't relate exactly to the context that people are talking about. I contribute it to the mouthpiece being a 5C being too small and your lip not having enough room to flap around in the mouthpiece, especially yeah. when you start pounding on it, you get tired, you swell up, yeah. everything cuts off. With the big mouthpiece, you got room for your lip to swell up and you can just keep playing. Right, right. And what, what did you settle on um, in the, at the Met? What was your go-to mouthpiece that you ended up on? I, 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 I used the, the, mouth, the mouthpiece that McElroy put the in. The same one. I used that one for, for all my auditions and for my first. Yeah, very similar story to mine where I had a teacher who said, get rid of this mouthpiece. You're using this one from now on, whether you like it or not. And to this day, that's the same mouthpiece I used for all my auditions, my entire professional career up to this present point. Still using that mouthpiece. So, if you have a teacher who knows what they're talking about in the equipment area, do what they say, honestly. It could, it could change the entire traje trajectory of your career. Of course, I'm not a mouthpiece person. Like, when I have students who are blaming their gear instead of blaming their technique, I will get on them about that. But there's a time and a place where having that proper setup for the context of what you're doing does make a difference five or six years at the Met. Wow. And okay. the only reason I changed it is because I hit it with a six iron swing and golf club <laughs> well, in my apartment well, in New course, York. Of course you did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stories all this time, yeah. Yeah. It was everybody. <laughs> <laughs> These Met guys were crazy. There's some crazy Met stories that I've heard that I cannot repeat. <laughs> that I, it's, I would get in trouble if I repeated it. Um, just kind of through the grapevine. But even a lot of these New York guys, I've heard some stories that are way crazier than this. But I can't say it. How in the hell did you hit it with a six iron in your apartment? <laughs> oh, my cat turned my leather chair around. It was sitting on a leather chair and he spun it around with his big 
tall tale, uh -huh. and I made a horrific swing, <laughs> and the trumpet turned into a pretzel. It would <laughs> hit the ground. I was like, oh, no. Oh. So from that point on, I spent about, you know, five grand on mouthpieces after that and never really God. did find anything, so... So uh, back to the story. What were after college? You said is when you had a real transformation. What happened then, after college? Uh, I dis well, it's, I was having uh, I was having poor me issues. <laughs> was I playing for me or was I playing for my father? Did I really want to be a trumpet player? Oh but wow! All this psychobabble bullshit. Yeah. So do what you're passionate about, guys. I mean, I know parents. Some parents set these expectations for their kids, and then they the kids think they need to follow in into those expectations. But you got to pursue what you're passionate about. I mean, my dad was a trumpet player, and he taught me how to play. But I pursued trumpet as a career because I enjoyed it, not because my dad was a trumpet player. So do what your heart tells you to do is what I'll say to them about that. Sure. Well, were you playing well at the time? No. Well, all right. Okay. You know. I didn't know that I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once I decided that I actually wanted to, for me, that's when it kind of, wow, it, it kind of took off that's after that stuff. Uh huh. It was, uh, yeah. Hmm. Mm hmm. So it was within you. It wasn't something that happened. It wasn't a teacher you saw or anything. It was no. Just deciding that you wanted to do it for yourself. Yeah, it was com uh, that I. Yeah, because I went after Juilliard. I went to Mexico City for a year. Played. Uh, associate principal down in the Mexico City Philharmonic yeah and after that we had to leave because every, everything was in chaos yeah so the year following that I probably pretty much didn't play for quite a long time just wow I was a sales clerk at a thrifty drugstore yeah comeback player if you will where some of these guys I mean, I've heard different stories like this with some now famous and well-known trumpet players where they took a lot of time off like they didn't play trumpet like there was there's some gap that they took between when they studied in school to when they became the professional that they are today sometimes it's not always a straight line sometimes they've done all their work in the meantime until they got their big break so this is not uncommon no you weren't yeah thrifty gym <laughs> employee of the month how long did you take <laughs> you were not you were employee of the month yeah, too. i was so you were actually about, good at it about about 10 months i worked there so you did, how long did you take off the trumpet? Almost a year. You didn't touch it? Well, kind of on and off. Just barely touched yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then you just kind of had a soul searching and decided that that was... Yeah, I decided that I wasn't happy and... Uh, You're employee of the month, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wasn't happy. Seems and like you had My a wife <laughs> sat me down one day and said, you're miserable. I can't stand seeing you like this and you yeah. got to play. Wow. And uh, at that point, principal trumpet for the Rhode Island Philharmonic was open. Yeah. And that's not a job. but So you did it. I went from Southern California. and uh, It's a job. I mean, not everyone is going to play trumpet in the Met. Not everyone is going to have the big gigs like that. But to a lot of players, like being principal of the Rhode Island Phil would be a huge accomplishment. Like a lot of, I got it, it's sad to say, but a lot of, people who study music don't get any of these jobs. They don't get anything. They, they either switch career paths where they're in that limbo stage where they're doing some other kind of work, expecting to one day get the job, and then they never do. That I'm, I'm not being negative. That's just kind of the reality. But if you get that kind of job like principal with the Red Line Symphony, that, that's a huge accomplishment. You should be proud of that. Yeah, I went back to my dad's house and 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 succumbed to his will. Wow. <laughs> and I had three weeks to to get in shape and and win the audition for the Rhode Island Philharmonic. So you prepared for three weeks for the audition after ha having played for about yeah. a year. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and I won the audition, and I had to beat Russell Davis, uh, uh, who's a really good trumpet player. He just quit his job in Montreal. He was playing in Montreal for years and years. Yeah. 24 years so I had to actually be the legitimate player too Wow! Uh, so after that uh, I moved back to Rhode Island from California and that's when I found out I was going blind the wow. doctor said after he said six months you're not gonna be able to read anything anymore oh, and he was right yeah. and uh, I was like wow what do I do now 
I said, well, shit, let's just keep going. So I just kept going. So I kept taking auditions, and I was runner-up in Seattle for Principal Trumpet. Yeah. And uh, I think Charlie Baker got the job back then. Charlie Butler? Butler, right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so these were all auditions where you were playing great, and then they got to the final round, and you felt like you played well, but the screen was down, and you got axed. Well, yeah, but in it's Seattle, I, I, I... That's a great story, though, even though he was having this medical condition with his eyesight, that he just kept going. He persevered and kept going anyway. That's, like, hugely inspiring. I screwed the pooch on, on sight reading because I just couldn't, I couldn't read. Oh, really? Yeah. And then the next audition uh, was the Oklahoma Symphony, and uh, that took forever. That took like four trips out and playing with the orchestra, and, hmm. and uh, so I finally got the Oklahoma Symphony job, and uh, that was okay. It was, the first year was okay. Second year was uh, I hadn't found my telescope yet. And, yeah. Uh, well, I got a couple more questions yeah. before we go to the monster round. All right. Uh, the, <laughs> we we did some homework. We talked to Mark Gould and Pete Bond. All right, so we're going to get to some Met stories, like I said. So it's not the crazy stuff that I'm talking about. I mean, but these are still pretty funny. Pete uh-huh. wouldn't give us any info on you. <laughs> I'm still mad at you, Pete. I'm hoping you leave some dirt. <laughs> but Mark Gould came through for us. I don't know what any of this means, but he gave me two things. He said, first of all, he says he saved your job after a stage performance of Pagliacci. Absolutely true. What happened? Absolutely true. This is this great. He did save my job. Uh, uh, I played a Pagliacci on stage one Saturday night, and uh, it was like the last show of the week. And mm-hmm. I figured, well, shit, after I'm done playing the call, I'm off. So I, I like to act a lot when I'm on stage because I, I was on stage. I used to you used to bite the coin, you know, and call the chorus. Yeah. Often in like musical, if you're doing like a musical theater pit and doing or like a Broadway show or even operas, sometimes the pit musicians need to be actors. Sometimes they play a part in the story. Like, for example, I saw um, saw Chicago on Broadway uh, in New York City and the band was part of the show. Like, they, they would interact with the cast members. They'd be part of the show. They were on stage with the other actors. So sometimes for these gigs, you got, you got to break out some acting chops, even if you're not really good. So forewarned. For us on stage and take money. You know, I was just doing the shtick, man. I was yeah, yeah. Jim, the actor up there. <laughs> so as I finish it, I say, ah, hell, I'm done. So I put the trumpet under my under my arm, and I pull out a little bottle of shivis from my sash, and I go pop, and go 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 go, Boop, and put on it back stage. in my sash, <laughs> put it on stage, put it back in my sash, and I, and I walked off stage, and I'm happy. You know, that's really funny. Like he he's, he's playing the part. He's trying to he's enter, he's he's in entertainment mode. He's trying to entertain an audience. I mean, obviously, he, he was technically drinking on stage, drinking on the job. But in this context, of course, he was, he was trying to be silly. So the phone rings at 9 o'clock next Sunday morning. It's like 9.15. Mark Gould's on the phone. He goes, Jim? <laughs> yeah? Jim? <laughs> yeah? What's up? He goes, Jim? Were you drinking on stage last <laughs> night? I was like, uh, wh- why? Well, uh, I've gotten some phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. He goes, Jesus Christ. He goes, if anybody asks, deny it. it was, there was tea in that bottle. <laughs> so it's true. He did say my job. Oh, my God. Helping a brother out. I love it. <laughs> So I'm guessing they contacted Mark first to ask about it, and they haven't contacted Jim yet, so Mark was trying to warn him, being like, hey, these guys are going to ask. You weren't drinking if they ask. So otherwise, if they caught him off guard, he might have admitted that he was drinking to the wrong people and then lost his job. So that's helping a brother out. God, that is yes, hysterical. but... But I saved his life twice, though. Whoa, what? I saved his life Go on. twice. Go on. Well, the first time was when the trumpet section uh, went down to Sammy's Romanian Steakhouse on the east side. 
and uh, we had dinner, and Gould ordered vodka, and so they bring out a bottle of vodka frozen in a block of ice and put it on the table. Uh -huh. Well, we were so wrecked <laughs> coming out. These mech guys, I've heard some stories, all oh, I'm going to say. Of Sammy's Romanian that Gould stepped right into the street, into an oncoming car. Oh, my God. And, and the blind guy grabbed him by the back of the <laughs> neck and pulled him back, and the car went... <sighs> so that was the first time. Still helping a brother out. <laughs> the second time was on stage in Aida, the last time he ever played Aida. Uh, we're standing on stage on a box, and our feet, with no railing around or anything, our yeah. feet are about 12 feet off the stage, mm -hmm. 10 to 12 feet up in the air. So that's, a, that's pretty high up there. Yeah. And so the wall's coming down with the soldiers on top of it. And if you're not careful, you can get vertigo. And, uh, yeah. And so anyway. Uh, Sounds like a very old school telephone I'm hearing in the background. It's kind of funny. <laughs> so anyway, I told Gould, I said, listen, when the wall starts going down, I said, don't look at the wall. You got to look at the crack in the floor where the wall's going down there. And if you just look at the crack of the wall, you're going to be cool. But if you look at the wall, you're going to get weird. You're oh. going to start doing that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm guessing in these opera performances where they, um, the musicians need to be on stage positioned in some way, rather than like a traditional orchestra pit where they're sitting kind of like right in front of the stage or even below the stage. So they, they were probably positioned where they had to stand on a platform or something on the stage. And when the curtain comes up or whatever, it can mess with your vision. You can lose balance. And you hear the rest of this. But what I didn't tell him is, is that when we bring the trumpets up in unison... When you bring the herald trumpets up, mm -hmm. you see the bells going up against the background of the of the Met and the wall and everything. And Gould started going like, like this, and he started and and he started going over. And I grabbed him with my left hand and I played the thing with my right hand. And he just stood there the whole time, just going. He didn't play a note? Not a note. <laughs> you played the whole what? thing. <laughs> I just grabbed him. Just grabbed him and held him in place. Because he almost went. He, was, he started doing this one. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, 12 feet would kill you. Yeah, and oh all God. the chorus girls were down below there. So we would have we hurt them, too. Oh, okay. But those those are the two times that I saved yeah, his he life. Didn't. Interesting stories. I love it. This is what I like to hear. Like... Stories like this is what makes the trumpet world fun, I gotta say. He didn't yeah. mention those. Yeah, say, he saved my career. Yes, he did. Second one, Brandenburg in a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is classic. Uh, uh, I got to play the Brandenburg with Jimmy at Carnegie Hall, and uh, and I, I guess it it was default goes to me. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we. Bach Brandenburg Concerto. It's a piccolo trumpet part, and it's probably one of the most hardest things to perform in the classical trumpet world. Like, so many players turn it down if they get asked to do it because they're afraid of it. Very hard, so easy to get lost. So, just putting that in context is an extremely difficult piece of music. We're rehearsing it, and... Uh... Mark played the Brandenburg. He said he won, he won an audition for the Hartford <coughs> Symphony or something like that. Springfield Symphony under right. Brandenburg. He but, wanted nothing to do with it. it. He was oh, like, okay. it's yours, man. Okay. Exactly. Like, he didn't want to do it. <laughs> like, it's it's like if, if uh, let's say you are get called for a Christmas gig and the, the music director in the church wants to do Brandenburg for whatever reason, like the, the go-to answer is, oh, sorry, I don't know that one. <laughs> to just to try to get yourself out of it. A extremely difficult piece. So many pros turn it down because they just want nothing to do with it. Uh, so we're at the dress rehearsal, and uh, in Wild Wild Recital Hall at Carnegie, mm -hmm. and Jimmy has the band over on the right hand side of the stage, and he's in the middle, and I'm like over on the left hand side of the stage, completely alone. Mm -hmm. And I played it from memory because 
I couldn't see it anyway, and <laughs> I was tired of pretending, and I didn't want to stand in front of me, so yeah. So I played it from memory, didn't use any music. So uh, we're rehearsing it, and uh, Jimmy's conducting, and instead of pointing straight out into the hall, I kind of did a little, you know, towards the middle, mm -hmm. and, and Jimmy stops, and he goes, Adolph, uh, Adolph be, be careful there, you, you, you're zigging me a bit. And I looked at him, and I don't know why, I looked at him and I said, well, what are you going to do for the people in the first three rows? Have them sign a disclaimer before they come in? <laughs> and the whole f That's funny. So, in the professional world, don't talk back to the conductor. Don't do that. He's technically the guy that is giving you that job, and he can take away your paycheck at a moment's notice or not hire you back. So... Take caution. Freaking bad just <laughs> fell out of the floor laughing. And Jimmy's sitting there going, I'm, 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 because it's not funny unless he says it, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, we went on with the rehearsal. And uh, then he asked me, uh, do you want to do anything tomorrow before the show? And I was like, no, let's come, just come in and do it. Okay, fine. So the performance day comes up. It's in the morning. Uh, Ken Hunt calls. Ken is this, is, is this guy who takes care of everything. Yeah. And uh, he says, uh, Jimmy needs to see you before, before the performance. I said, well, why? I said, he told me we're not doing anything. Uh, no, he needs to see you. I was like, oh, man. So I've, uh -oh. I had to get dressed, take a shower, get dressed, go down there, go see him. He, he, he just finished rehearsing another one of the Brandenburgs. And he goes, oh, Dolph, oh, I'm, I'm glad you came in. You know, you know I, I, was thinking about, I was thinking about what you said the other day. And, well, well I, I was wondering if, if you would mind, like, playing into this. And he had a stand with a velvet pillow <laughs> taped to it. Got to be kidding me. That's, that's funny. Oh, my God. Some of these conductors, it can get ridiculous. Oh my god! And I and I looked at him and I said, "Absolutely not." <laughs> I said, "Listen, it's gonna." And then I went and went into the trumpet thing, and I said, "Listen, it's gonna it's gonna mess up the resistance. It's gonna mess up my balance. And besides, I'm playing it from memory because I don't want anything in front of me." Uh -huh. And he goes, "Oh well, okay." And so, you know, the performance went off, and uh, I, I did really well. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, Dolph, you hot shit, and gave me a big <laughs> hug. And, and that was it. So, so you told Jimmy Levine what was up. You said, I'm going to do it this way. That's pretty much true, yeah. <laughs> so Peter Bond, bless <laughs> Peter. Yeah, so some of these conductors who don't know the trumpet so well sometimes make ridiculous requests where it's almost laughable uh tell you a story so it had, didn't happen to me but i heard this from one of my teachers where there was a situation where they were playing seed trumpets in the orchestra and then the conductor who was a little bit of a hothead he stops the ensemble he calls out the trumpet section he's like hey uh i think you guys would be better i think it would sound a little bit better if you guys played that these that excerpt on seed trumpets instead but little did he know they were already playing C trumpets. So what they did is like, the principal was like, okay, we're going to pretend to switch trumpets just to satisfy this guy. So they literally pretended to put away their, their trumpet. And then they just, same as, same exact C trumpet, just got it back out again. They just pretended to switch. And then they played it again. And then the conductor was like, oh my God, that was so much better. Same exact trumpet. So... You gotta be patient with some of these conductors. He he gets this pillow with a hole in it, and he has the, the first page the first page of the score to the Brandenburg two all burned off and cinched on the corners and everything. And there's a big hole in the thing, and he and he goes up to Jimmy. And he goes, "Hey, this, Jimmy, this is for Dolph. Would you sign it?" So Jimmy signed <laughs> signed the pillow you for still me. Have it? I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny story. But anyway, yeah, it, it is true.
All right. Well, those are all my questions. I got one more segment we like to do for everybody. It's mm -hmm. called the monster round. It's like a lightning round. So mm -hmm. we just ask you rapid fire questions. Okay. And you answer as quickly as you can. Yep. And concisely that whole thing. So this is the monster round with Jim Pandolfi. What's the first thing you would do as president? All right. So the rest of this isn't trumpet related. So we're just going to cut it off here. But thanks for watching, guys. That was Jim Pandolfi's Brass Chats, what I would consider the best trumpet interview ever. So, let it up. I want to know what you thought about this. This is probably my favorite trumpet interview of all time. So let me know what you thought in the comments. Be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel because if you want to see more content like this, trumpet related, all your trumpet related needs. And see you next time, guys. Take care.